The insight. insight. The insightum. Podcast. Genetics. Human. Archaeology. Denisovans. Neanderthals. Metabolism. Ancestry. Where in the world did we come from? I am unique DNA. Genome from Austin, Austin Texas. Texas. This week, cheddar more than a cheese. First of all, welcome to the insight. Today we will be talking about Cheddar Man. Remember to give us five star reviews for our podcast and also write a positive review if possible. We really want to get the word out there. So we would really appreciate it if you help us out. Okay. I'm Spencer Wells, founder and CEO of Insightome. I'm Razib Khan, not the founder and CEO of Insightome <laughs> and the director of scientific content. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about something that has very much been in the news recently. A man named Cheddar. In fact, his name is Cheddar Man. Is this a man made of cheese? Well, wh why don't you talk about it, Spencer? Because I think you know a little bit more of the backstory. Actually, you do in terms of you were working in related fields with related people, people related to Cheddar Man, literally and metaphorically. Yeah, so Cheddar. Cheddar actually comes from a town, the name of a town in southwestern England. So it's near Bristol and Bath in the county of Somerset. This is the town that gives its name to the cheese. The cheese was first made there. And the cool thing is the cheese was made there initially because there are all these caves in a gorge outside of town. And those caves stabilized the temperature and the humidity so you could age cheese there. And that gave us cheddar cheese. And those same caves also preserved human remains, including the remains of an individual from a long time ago who has been given the name Cheddar Man. Cheddar Man lived 9,150 years ago in England, and it is the oldest remains in England that is so complete. So there are some other trace remains or less complete remains, but they're not the whole skeleton. Cheddar Man is the whole skeleton. So the preservation is really good, and this is important from a genetic perspective. Spencer? Yeah, so... We've talked a lot about ancient DNA in these podcasts and how revolutionary it's been in terms of our understanding of the human past. Um, we did two entire podcasts on what we discovered about Neanderthals and introgression into the human population. So if you're interested, you can check those out. We have also talked, you know, most recently in both Journey of Man and the Indo-European podcast about the insights um, ancient DNA has given us into the more recent past. So verging into almost the historical realm in the case of Indo-Europeans. And then this interesting period around 9,000 years ago, which is Cheddar Man. And that's an interesting transitional period in European prehistory. So in the first podcast, we talk about the Neolithic Revolution. We mentioned this weird period called the Mesolithic, which, yeah, yeah. What, what's the Mesolithic? Well, it's kind of the latter part of the Paleolithic just before the hunter-gatherers went agricultural, basically. And so this, this guy, Cheddar Man, was at the tail end of the Paleolithic period just before agriculture moved into England. So he's one of the last true hunter-gatherers that lived in England. So it's an interesting phase in history. So one of the last, I mean, I think there are a couple of, thousand years after it that there were hunter-gatherers in england right but do we have any remains from hunter-gatherers that are younger than that i i'm yeah i got okay well okay so there's a new preprint on bioarchive and it's about cheddar man um you can find it you know maybe I, I, i'm gonna by the time you listen to this i will have a blog post on cheddar man so um you can check it out they do have several hunter-gatherers the genetics the spatial genetics of england we have more mesolithic remains from england and not just cheddar like i think they said six or seven in the preprint than we do from all of asia i'm, I'm kind of <laughs> sick of british genetics on some level honestly like i don't need to know about the population structure in north wales i know that paper is coming and i know it'll somehow get into plus genetics i mean spencer's laughing but I'm no, not it's lying. true. It's true. I'm not I mean, lying. There are historical reasons why, you know, lots of Europeans have been sampled. Um, there are also, you know, climatological reasons and geological reasons. So it's a cold place or a relatively cold place with lots of caves. And so, you know, that's where, you know, ancient remains tend to stick around. And the DNA in particular tends to stick around the longest is in those types of places. Doesn't stick around so long in a wet, swampy, tropical rainforest. 
So, you know, there's a lot of material to work with. And so what's the what's the takeaway? I mean, we'll talk in a minute about the headlines that have come out in the, the newspaper. You know, you've got the Daily Mail and the Express and the Telegraph, and they all, you know, have their own takeaway from this. But, you know, in, in reading the science, what is the takeaway here? Just confirm, six Mesolithic in the new preprint, okay? But in any case, the takeaway is Cheddar Man's descendants probably never did pick up agriculture. The big takeaway from the paper is there was almost a total replacement during the Neolithic in much of Great Britain. Okay, so again, just to remind people, if you haven't listened to that first podcast, it's, it is worth a re-listen because this was a fairly important period in human history, the Neolithic Revolution. Neolithic, the dawn of agriculture, um, a few people in locations around the world starting around 10,000 years ago start to settle down. Um, the best studied, perhaps, is the Fertile Crescent, so in the Middle East, and they started to farm their crops and domesticated animals. And we start to see farming and agriculture more broadly spread outside of these zones of origin over the next several thousand years. And one of the big debates in European prehistory in particular has been, was it people moving in out of the Middle East who brought that culture with them, or was it simply cultural diffusion? So the hunter-gatherers are like, hey, farming looks awesome. Let's try that. Yeah, and um, as you know, per the previous podcast, it's basically pots not people now in some cases they didn't have pots if they're mesolithic hunter gatherers they might not have had pots but the whole stylized idea here is that cultural diffusion happens and means ideas are moving the way spencer stated it earlier if you took it literally in terms of cheddar man before you know the cheddar man people became agriculturalists this was actually the mainstream idea up until the late 2000s and then there was a lot of debate and now the debate is ended because in science you converge on new results and new models, which are, you know, the consensus of the period. And these results are very striking that there was almost total replacement of the indigenous hunter-gatherer that settled in what became Britain after the last ice age with the arrival of Neolithic people, probably from Southwest Europe rather than Central Europe more. So literally, you've got a group of agriculturalists who move into England around that time and they replace the hunter-gatherers who were there before, these Mesolithic guys like Cheddar Man. And by replace, you know, as we've said several times in this podcast series, we mean like the hunter-gatherers died off and the agriculturalists lived on. So whether there was a mass slaughter or not, we don't know. But certainly genetically, the hunter-gatherers didn't leave a huge imprint on the present-day British population through that, that cultural transition. Yeah, and so just to, uh, I do have a computer in front of me, so I've been looking things up. The Neolithic in Britain, just for listeners, starts 4,000 BC. Cheddar Man so 6,000 years ago. Yeah, and Cheddar Man, so da- Cheddar Man dates to 3,000 years before that, mm-hmm. right? So the Neolithic starts 6,000 years ago, and it ends about 4,500 years ago, 2,500 BC. That's when the Bell Beakers come which that's a different podcast. And that's the Bronze Age. That's the Bronze, well, yeah, Bronze, Copper Age, Mm -hmm. Middle Age, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this period of about 1,500 years of Neolithic Britain. And these people, if you look at how they're genetically related, they're very, very similar to Sardinians, which obviously is not very similar to modern Northern Europeans. So one of the takeaways is the Cheddar Man people, these Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, didn't have that much of a genetic impact. But also the Neolithic people themselves were later replaced. So we are talking about multiple replacements in Britain within the last 10,000 years, which is pretty interesting. It's really interesting. And it's it's kind of scary, you know, to think about like an entire population being replaced. You know, it, it, it conjures up images of, you know, as we've talked about before, Conan the Barbarian, mass slaughters, and so on. So that's a little freaky. Let, let's get some, you know, vocabulary out of the way, and the acronyms in particular, because this is where ancient DNA has its own little lingo yeah. that even other yes. population geneticists aren't necessarily aware of. So... Technically, what an ancient DNA specialist would call Cheddar Man is a representative of the WHG people. What's a WHG? WHG in the OG, no. Um, (laughs) (laughs) WHG is Western hunter-gatherer, and that just refers to the hunter-gatherers pretty much in the Western third of modern Europe. Western half, maybe, as opposed to Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, SHG, as opposed to Eastern hunter-gatherers, 
E H G. E H G. Um, just, and they're Eastern European farmers and yeah. EEF. So early, early, yeah. EEF is early European farmers. Mm-hmm. And these are the first agriculturalists that came to Europe, probably mostly from Anatolia. And these are the people that were the ancestors of the Neolithic Britons. So the best representative of EEF populations proportionally in the modern world are Sardinians. And that is because... They probably weren't as subject to the Metal Age migrations as other parts of Europe. Yeah. I mean, the issue is apparently Indo-Europeans are scared of water. (laughs) Well, if they came in riding horses, which we now think they probably did, it would make sense. Yeah. They're like cats. No. (laughs) (laughs) So Sardinia was relatively insulated. In fact, Paleo-Sardinian is a language that possibly was not Indo-European. Latin in Sardinia is due to the Roman Empire. Sardinia was under Phoenician influence. There was a couple, couple of Greek colonies. But, and it's uh, got remote villages up yeah. in the mountains, yeah. and you know people couldn't always get up there to conquer the, the people living yes. in these tiny villages. So. And um, Sardinians actually genetically are, they share a lot with Basques, who don't speak an Indo-European language. There is, like, I mean, it's very, very difficult because you have to go by place names and odd words mentioned in ancient texts. There is some suggestion that Sardinian, Paleo-Sardinian, and Basque were part of the same broad li- language family, which was probably spoken by the Neolithic Britons as well, because it was a really rapid expansion. So to get back to Cheddar Man and, you know, WHG, I was not surprised about the Cheddar Man results at all, because now we have a fair amount of ancient DNA from Europe. And it's always telling that story that, you know, basically there was this abrupt shift as the farmers come in and they replace the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, the WHGs. So what you're saying here is that the average Briton today is closer genetically to the average Sardinian today than he would be, he or she would be, to the Cheddar Man? As they say on Facebook, it's complicated. (laughs) So um, the preprint actually has a principal component analysis, uh, so basically just visual representation of the genetic relatedness. And let me just double, let me double check. So the issue is there was a replacement in the Bronze Age, right? So the Neolithic people are very similar to Sardinians. The Cheddar Man population is actually different from anything that exists in pure form today because these Western hunter-gatherers were absorbed into the expanding farmers, and also they were part of the steppe expansion being absorbed into this mixing population. So modern Europeans are like like gumbo. They have a lot of different (laughs) parts. Now, you can change the proportions, but there's almost no European population that's represented by any of these acronyms. Even Sardinians themselves have some non-EEF ancestry. Some of it's from hunter-gatherers, and some of it probably later into Europeans. We're not sure about that. Um, We could, you know, different podcast, right? I'm not going to go off on that tangent. But really quickly, um, looking at the PCA, it looks like modern British people who are mostly descended from bell beakers who arrived from Central Europe are actually little, are somewhat closer to Cheddar Man because they have Western hunter-gatherer. But they're distinct from both Cheddar Man and the Neolithic people. This is where it does start to get complicated. Yeah, yeah. And- but, well, and, and, and like this is the, the really cool part about ancient DNA. It's not just like you're going back to one point in time and you're extrapolating, like drawing a line between 9,000 years ago and the present day. There's lots of stuff going on. And the cool thing is you can literally do, you know, what has been called in the literature, a transect through time, and you can see these changes. And the problem with looking at people alive today, and, you know, this is an issue that has really come to the fore as we've gotten more ancient DNA results. The people alive today are a palimpsest of all of these ships that have gone on throughout history. If you just look at the present day, you're going to miss all the details. And so that's why ancient DNA is so awesome. Yeah, and so let me um let me be specific for the nerds out there, and I know we have some nerd <laughs> listeners. Uh, there is substructure in Neolithic Britain. Their sample size for Neolithic Britain is really large. They have more samples from Neolithic Britain than we do have from a lot of uh, modern populations. Well, it makes sense. I mean, farming populations were enormous in comparison to hunter-gatherer populations. So, you know, if you just imagine throwing a dart at a map, you know, you're likely to hit a Neolithic Britain before you hit a Mesolithic Britain. Yeah, and I, I read the preprint, and so what you see here is um, Cheddar Man on the PCA is approximately 
basically, um, there was some admixture. The Neolithic people in the south and the west, uh, say Cornwall, Wales, seem to have almost no hunter-gatherer admixture that's above and beyond what you find in the southwest European Neolithic populations. You see, it seems like a little more hunter-gatherer admixture as you go east in these samples. That's interesting. So towards East Anglia and Southeast England. I would have predicted the opposite because, I mean, the, the theory always is, well, you know, people probably enter Britain through the part that's closest to continental Europe, which is southeastern England. And therefore, you have things like the Celtic fringe, which, you know, didn't, they weren't affected as much, the, the thinking goes. And, you know, we have, don't have all the genetic data yet, but we certainly have some affected less by some of these Germanic migrations that brought, you know, Anglo-Saxons. So Anglo-Saxons enter through the southeast and the Celtic fringe gets pushed over to Ireland and up to, into Scotland. So that's that's a little surprising. You know, by the time that this podcast is posted, I'll actually dig into the details and look at the summary statistics so I can talk about the genetic distance more concretely because, you know, there's issues with the eigen eigenvalues I don't want to get into. If you know what that means, you know what I mean. But um, in terms of what Spencer is saying, this actually was a big issue in the paper or the preprint. And I, I know that th there's archaeologists like Tom Booth, for example, is on this preprint and he knows the archaeology. And there's a lot of controversy and they alluded to it. Like, where did these farmers come from? Among the early EEF, there were two, two prongs. One prong went into Central Europe using the River Rhine Valleys up the Danube. Another prong seems to have hopped from fertile coastal area to fertile coastal area around the Mediterranean and then around. So are around. you saying they, they might have used boats to get yeah. around? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm assuming so because yeah. they, they got to Portugal really quickly, but the hinterlands of Iberia were relatively unsettled. So we've got time. our inland group and we've got our seafaring group. Yeah, and it looks, if you model it, so part of the issue here is WHG and EEF, both are relatively homogenous within each other, probably because they went through recent population bottlenecks. So extinction and resettlement seems to be a recurring nar narrative in Europe, right? People go extinct for whatever reason, and other populations expand really rapidly. EEF expanded really rapidly. It's really hard to distinguish between the different you know, segments of EEF, but it looks like the British Neolithic, more of its ancestor seems to be closer to the people of the cardial culture, which is Southwest Europe, than the culture of Central Europe, LBK, Linear Beaker, or no. Linear Bunkeramik. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, Spencer, thanks with your German. Um, Deutsch. But uh, in any case, so that's what they say in the paper. I find this fascinating because there's a whole narrative or framework of the Atlantic fringe and facing the ocean and how important boats and sea travel were in the ancient world. So, for example, um, we know that the Neolithic in Britain persisted to about, you know, 2,500 BC when the bell beakers came. Stonehenge predates that by centuries. So Stonehenge and these megaliths were probably, in my opinion, a common culture that was united by the sea, probably a descendant of these early European farmers in Spain and Southern France. We call them cardio culture, you know, call them different things in different parts of Europe, but they probably spoke a similar Basque like language and they probably transmitted ideas and they were all farmers from the same ancestral source with probably similar religion. And so it's not surprising that things like megaliths, expensive, hard to fake cultural displays expand really quickly across this common zone. So the, the paper didn't just look though at um, DNA as a passenger telling us who these people were related to, although that's very, very interesting. There's nothing really shocking in those results. What has been portrayed certainly in the press is some of the aspects that you can infer about this individual, Cheddar Man in particular, from his DNA. And of course, the one that's made all the headlines is Cheddar Man was black. Talk about that. Well, I mean, Spencer, since you're mostly British, how do you feel being black? Since you're 10% of your genome is supposedly from Cheddar Man. Do you I, feel different? I think, I think it's awesome. Yeah. Okay. But but um, is is that the case? I mean, could he have had very dark skin, what we might call black? Yeah. So the media, some of the media has gotten a little confused. About 10% of the ancestry of modern Britons can be ascribed to someone like Cheddar Man, but they were very equivocal in the paper whether there was really any admixture from Western hunter-gatherers in Britain itself. Because the Western hunter-gatherers on the continent 
sampled from Belgium, sampled from Spain, are all very similar to Cheddar Man. So there's 10% of the genome of modern Europeans is Cheddar Man-like. The key is like. There might be no direct descendants of Cheddar Man. So I want to put that out there. They're very equivocal in the preprint. And it's, just, it's, it's really confusing because all these populations that are within each cluster are quite homogenous and it's hard to distinguish. Now, setting that aside, the Black Cheddar Man issue is all in the media and i went on youtube mostly i was looking at the child Ford documentary you know clips of that which is on the bbc and it actually aired i mean as of this recording it aired on the weekend previous so a lot of the listeners hopefully we have british listeners they have seen it the reconstruction is very interesting because it's a very dark brown person with blue eyes now the reason it has blue eyes is really straightforward about 75 percent of the variation when you dichotomize blue versus non-blue in European eye color can be ascribed to one locus, one genetic region, HERC2, OCA2. And so a lot of Western European, almost all, but not exclusively, I think there's been some exceptions, of Western European hunter-gatherers seem to have this light eye variant, which the highest frequency I've seen in Europe is, I think, in Scandinavia, where you know places like Finland, uh, southern and eastern Sweden could be ninety percent. Yeah, it's kind of Baltic. I mean, that's the highest frequency yeah. in the world. It's you know around Estonia yeah. and southern Finland. But and... even in the Baltic, it's a little lower. This could be a sampling issue, but even in the Baltic, it's a little lower than it was in WHG hmm. Western Hunter Gatherers. Hmm. Now that could be just the bottleneck. Could be some selection that we don't understand. But WHG was really, really overloaded on this locus. Now, it's not; it doesn't look like it came from there. There are other populations all across the world, even in the ancient DNA, that had it. So I believe one of the um, Caucasian hunter-gatherers, like literally from the Caucasus, I think it was segregating in one of those, right? So this is around a long time ago. They had that. So that's not surprising because blue eyes are very common in Britain today. That isn't surprising, but the dark skin in combination with the blue eyes. Yes is a little surprising because we tend to think of blue eyes going in lockstep with kind of overall pigmentation and people with you know gunmetal blue eyes tend to have blonde hair or maybe red hair you know they freckle they have light skin they sunburn when they go to any place in the tropics so that's unusual yeah and so um this is where i you know throw out the little chestnut that correlation is not causation right so just because you see two things correlated for example most people with blonde hair in the world do not have tight, frizzy hair. But we know that they're actually not phenotypically correlated. They're not causally genetically correlated in any way. There are people with blonde hair with tight, frizzy hair. If you go to Brazil or you know Brazilians, you have seen people like that because Brazilians mix between Europeans and Africans. And so you get people with that phenotype, with that like characteristics. Or some Melanesians yes. due to a different mutation. That's entirely. a different mutation, yes. yes different story. But, but okay, so are we really talking then about a person who was darker than the average Brit today but had yes, very so. light eyes? I believe that the person was, uh, you know, so the issue is there are ways that you diagnose in forensic genetics, the complexion of modern Europeans. And those ac those tests are very accurate for modern Europeans. So what I would say is the training set. The training set is a variation in modern Europeans. So used by police departments, you find DNA in whatever form at the scene of a crime, and you want to kind of build a picture of what this individual might look like, what ethnic background they might have, etc. So you look at the DNA and you run it through this kind of, I guess it's like a machine learning algorithm based on a huge training set. Sets. You've got lots of reference individuals. You know exactly what they look like, obviously. And then based on genetic similarities, you can say, well, they probably fit in with this group and they mm -hmm. look like that. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, there are, these, there are predictions. But a prediction is not a guarantee, correct? And another issue here is when your outgroup population is very, very different than your training set, you're not always predicting correctly. So, for example, there are pigmentation and from a previous podcast, which you should have listened to just so you know, on adaptation last week. So I'm not going to repeat myself because you should have listened to that. Um, previous podcasts, there are certain loci where if you see those genes in a certain state, you know what that person looks like because in the modern population, the frequencies are just so extreme. And pigmentation is quite like that. Most of the variation, genetic variation in human populations is, is like all shared within groups and it doesn't distinguish the groups. But on pigmentation... 
they are very, very distinct quite often, which should not be that surprising because when you look at the physical types, they are quite very, very distinct. And pigmentation is, I mean, tanning aside and skin bleaching aside, it's mostly a genetic characteristic. So what you see is the loci, the genes where modern Europeans are very light, like why they are light and what explains lightness within modern European populations, those are on the often on the darker variants are what's fixed in these Western hunter-gatherers. So naively, you would simply predict, well, they are very dark, right? But pigmentation is polygenic. Just because you know some genes that are very, very important pigmentation, it doesn't mean that you're predicting the trait that well necessarily because there are other genes go that are you know segregating. And we know in East Asia, people are can be very light because of different genes. So pigmentation is something where there's a common set of genes and they get tuned constantly in mammals or tetrapods in general, they're often the same genes and they get switched back and forth to create the different color traits. But it doesn't mean there's just one way. And so when you look at modern Europeans, you have a certain genetic structure there, a certain amount of variation, and you're using that to make a prediction. You can't predict naively back into the past. I would say, based on everything I know, with a very moderate confidence, Okay, with a really high confidence, I would say that Cheddar Man was probably darker skinned than the average Briton today. Was Cheddar Man dark brown? I would say with a low confidence, no. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the thinking, just to remind people about skin color and the reason why today people in northern latitudes around the world, particularly in Europe, tend to have lighter skin than people living in the tropics, is the old story about vitamin D. So you live in the equator, near the equator, and particularly in the savannas of eastern Africa, you're out in the sun a lot, you need protection from that sunlight, and so we develop darker skin, and that's the ancestral state for humans. We now know that it's probably a little more complicated from Sarah Tishkoff's work. But the story is that as human populations left the tropics, moved into higher latitudes, we had to lose some pigmentation because there's less ambient sunlight striking your skin. And it turns out you need that to synthesize vitamin D, which most people didn't get in their diets. And But there's an exception. And so that's in fishing populations because they do get vitamin D in, in seafood. And so is it possible that maybe these Western hunter-gatherers were mostly living on fish, or at least they yeah. had that as a major component of their diet, and so they could afford to have darker skin? Yeah, I mean, the isotope analysis needs to be done. I mean, in terms of when you look at their bones, you can tell. I do know that, um, so about, wow, that was a long time ago, because I'm remembering where I lived. Over 10 years ago, I read an article on the BBC about how in England, well, Britain, the transition from hunter-gatherer to Neolithic was very quick, and it entailed a really rapid switch over in diet. And I think it's, they stopped eating fish when they first arrived. They're mostly, you know... If they ate non-vegetarian stuff, it was cattle or something. So that suggests that, you know, the diet of these hunter-gatherers are probably marine-rich, the North Sea area. I think there are high population densities, relatively high population densities of marine foraging populations. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, if you think about similar areas in other parts of the world, so Pacific exactly. Northwest and the U.S., um, had a very dense hunter-gatherer population focusing on seafood. Same thing with Japan Yeah. Um, when they were living as hunter-gatherers. Jomong. So it's entirely possible that, you know, you could have had relatively dense populations around England, Ireland, surviving mostly on coastal resources. And we know that, you know, there were very rich cod fishing banks, you know, up until relatively recently when they were overfished. But, you know, there's seafood there. You know, you can live on it. So yeah. that's an interesting idea. Well, so, you know, I want to take a step back from the genetics because the genetics does make this prediction. I understand why the genetics makes this prediction, but genetics are not all powerful. I mean, we obviously both love genetics, but that also means we know its limitations. So the reason that I'm making the assertion that Cheddar Man was probably not dark brown is because there are populations living at very high latitudes that are non-agricultural today or in the recent past. And the vast majority of them are not dark brown. So that's why I'm making that prediction. There's one exception, Tasmanians. Oh, yeah. Tell us about the Tasmanians. They're well, I mean, always an interesting That's uh, a different outlier. podcast. <laughs> I know you want to talk about the Tasmanians. So Tasmanians, I mean, like, I'll, t I'll say what I know. Um, Tasmanians are extinct, except for some people that descend from women that were enslaved. And they're, they're mixed race, the modern day Tasmanian, and they're predominantly European. I've seen and so Tasmanian pictures. island off the southeast coast of Australia. Australia. Yeah. yeah. And they were separated from um, the mainland populations uh, about 10,000 years ago, give or take, as sea levels rose. 
they obviously must have used boats or rafts to get to Australia. So we knew at some point their ancestors knew how to, you know, go to sea. But in Tasmania, they didn't. It's a small island. There was a lot of, like, cultural drift where they lost a lot of innovations that Australians had accrued. So that was what was going on there. When they were encountered by Europeans, physically, they did resemble Aust- the mainland Australians somewhat. But from what I – and I've seen some pictures. Um, and from what's descri- described, their hair was frizzier. They were dark-skinned like the mainland Australians, uh, dark brown. So you have people who are living at similar latitudes as, like, Central Europe that are dark brown. So that's possible. That is possible. I'm just saying we also have other Eurasian populations that live at high altitudes and also in the New World with Arctic peoples. And they tend to be, I don't know, you've been there. Like, how would you describe their, like, physical, like, complexion? Yeah, so Siberians, you know, very robust, stocky flat faces, which, you know, people have argued is an adaptation to the cold um, steppe land or tundra up there. Got cold winds blowing all the time. Possibly the epicanthic fold has something to do with that. I think there's a lot of just so stories being told. But yeah, I mean, they have a very distinctive appearance. And in terms of skin color, you know, I would say they're kind of medium brown. People will tan, certainly, when Mm -hmm. they're out in the sun during the summer, and they get paler during the winter. But, you know, no one by any stretch of the imagination would call them black. Or white. Or white. It's like that Michael yeah. Jackson song. Yeah, kind of. No. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, so, I mean, so this is why I'm making the assertion that I am, just because we can predict from genetics what we know about modern Europeans, and we project eight, or like 9,000 years into the past in a population that does not exist in pure form today. That's very, very dicey in other contexts, like genome-wide associations. Like people would be immediately bringing up this outgroup issue with the population structure, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, people want, I mean, I think there's an ideological reason people want to say it's a black Britain. Yeah, so let's go into that. What's your takeaway on the science reporting on all of this? I mean, do you think it's been hyper-sensationalist? Are you a little disappointed that people... We're talking about British science reporting. (laughs) So I mean that's which is which can be very good, yeah. but can also be yeah. There's a huge range. I mean, yeah. some of it was good. Some of the stuff I've read has been very, very good and very, very accurate. And I've read the preprint. I know some of the researchers. I've contacted them before they came out. We will be talking to one of the people on the preprint, Chris Stringer, um, on a future podcast. So subscribe. Some of it's been good. Some of it. So for example, here's a trivial um, error, which is common but shows how sloppy the science reporting has been. They have been saying that 10 percent of modern Britons descend from Cheddar Man in some of the reporting. It's 10% of the ancestry of modern Britons. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So that that's a statistical mistake. But that's a, it's a dead giveaway, though. Yeah, they're yeah, not, yeah. They don't know what's going on. They're not paying attention. Yeah. You know? Well, listen, there's been defunding of a lot of science reporting. I mean, we've heard all about it in the U.S. and, and certainly seen evidence of it over here. Yeah. And I think similar things are happening in the U.K. Sure. I, I do think, overall, the standard of science reporting in the U.K. is pretty damn good. Okay. No, well, I mean, you've got people like Robin McKee, okay. who, who's been writing about this stuff. I mean, he I, yeah. he's interviewed me before. He's written yeah, stories yeah. about my books and about Geographic. And, you know, Ed Young, I think, is a... I mean, isn't, isn't Edmund in the U.S. now? I don't know. He's he, in the Atlantic. Right he now. is writing for the Atlantic, but I'm pretty sure he still lives in, Does he? in the U.K. Edmund? Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I know his name is Edmund, so when is that? <laughs> but no, I, so listen, they're, they're great British science journalists. And they're also, of course, very good Americans. But so, it, overall, well, I, yeah. I think the reporting, you know, apart from the whole kind of headline thing, they got to grab you. Yeah. You know, first British, first so, Brit was black. Yeah. So he, the issue that I guess that I had um, is because we keep track of this very, very closely. We knew that, I mean, we... 95% confident that Cheddar Man. Actually, I think on Twitter I said I was 80 for, 80% confident with like, you know, various residuals that Cheddar Man was going to be WHG. And if you're WHG, you know that your homie is not going to have certain derived mutations <laughs> on these loci. So, of course, I knew that he was going to be predicted according to modern forensic techniques to be dark skinned. Now, when people say the first Briton was black, that has different connotations outside of a genetic context because the first Britain is descended from, I believe, the Villabruna culture, which derives from the Middle East in the late Pleistocene. So it has nothing to do with Sub-Saharan Africa, with Africa. But people, you know, that's their association. There's like ideological, political reasons. Another issue here is the first Britons were replaced in totality by Neolithic farmers who were replaced almost in totality by the Belgbeakers. So I don't really know what the lesson here is. Don't be replaced. 
<laughs> no, that's not what people are trying to take away. I'm just trying to say is that you can interpret these sorts of things any way you want to. I would rather focus on the science because it's frankly more interesting and it's less changeable based on the current political winds. I, you know, like people are trying to integrate this into like we should be welcoming of brown skinned people. And I have brown skin myself, like not Hayden, because um, the first Britons were brown skinned. But, you know, the reality is um, that's a bit of a leap, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, th- that we should do that or no, no, no. The, just that like because Cheddar Man might have had brown skin like. You make, but anyway, whatever. Well, that's, I mean, that's no, no, but I've seen YouTube's. I've seen you. Go yeah, on. I mean, this is where I think you know you're verging way beyond science. Yeah, and, but and, I mean, and, that's and why, what what the results are about. But that's why here. we're talking about Cheddar Man. Yeah, because yeah. Cheddar Man's political. And Cheddar Man doesn't have. I don't believe Cheddar Man has any political relevance for today. Absolutely right. But the science is interesting, but it gets overshadowed by the politics, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's the danger of any reporting these days. It is. A very um, emotionally charged time. Well, I mean, that's how, that's how reporting travels through social media. Yeah. So I guess you can't, again, like, we can't blame the reporters. We can't blame the media. But it's just part of this whole machine. And if you want the real truth, unvarnished by, like, political bias, just listen Re- to the insight. <laughs> and read the paper, which yes. is available read, for free yeah. on, on Bio Archive. Archive. Read the supplements. Always read the supplements. Some of the best stuff Rezzy is was a big fan of the supplements. I want to get a t-shirt that says, read the supplements. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's wrap it up with a question for you. Are we done with British genetics? I mean, as you were saying, like we've got a lot of samples from Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Bell Beaker, blah, 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 all over this little relatively small patch Scepter of land. Scepter Isle. <laughs> <laughs> all I Do we say- know the whole story now? Yeah, this is, I mean, we, we know 99%. I'm not, I have said that... Um, I will not read a paper on British population genomics anymore. Now, this was ancient DNA, so I made an exception because it was ancient DNA. But I am done. I am done with it. We know what we need to know. I don't need to know the difference between Lincolnshire and whatever shire. I don't need to know South versus South Central England. But, I, you know, the, the British, they've invested a lot in genetics. They have a lot of resources, so, you know, good on them. They have the Peopling of the British Isles database. It's a huge database, so you can publish. Poby. Yeah, and, like, you had some, like, you know, association or interaction with Yeah, no, people. when I was at Oxford, uh, Bodmer was trying to get that off the ground. Yeah. Um, and I think he got the funding from, was it Welcome or, I, figured, yeah, I think it might have been Welcome, soon after I left. And, and yeah, they, they spent a long time sampling people who've lived in the same villages for like, you know, umpteen million generations. And, you know, it's it's an amazing picture of British diversity. I don't know of any other place in the world that's really been sampled in quite no. the same way. And it's not just it's not just POBE. POBE is the pop gen stuff that we're super interested in, but there's also genome-wide association, pop gen functional genomics, like analysis of traits and disease, British the biobank. So Britain has done great things for genetics. So genetics should do great things for Britain. I understand that. All I'm trying to say is there are other parts of the world. <laughs> you know, there are other parts of the world with a lot of interesting variation. Including South Asia, which we've talked about before. And hopefully that paper, that very important ancient DNA paper, which will be a first, I believe, for but South there Asia. Was, there was ancient DNA, or not ancient, but there was um, some stuff in the Parsi paper on Parsis and also in Nepal, in the, you know, okay. almost in Tibet. Basically, stuff that's really marginal, no offense, to Parsis and, you know, tibeto burmans on the border with Tibet, to South Asian history. Yeah, so, I mean, we have more South Asian genetics from British South Asians than we do from South Asia. There's some serious problems there, and it's not the British fault. Yeah. I have to say that. it's not. So there's there's big stuff coming out of the rest of the world. It's time to maybe shift the lens. But Chatterman himself, interesting story, and it unpacks a lot about... Not only, you know, the early settlement of yeah. various parts of Northern Europe, but also in how we report on scientific results. And that's always been interesting to me. You know, um, just like to, to finish up, uh, if I think Bernard Cornwell, who wrote, um, like, uh, he's written a lot of novels. And he wrote a novel about bronze or like Copper Age more, I think, Britain. And about the interaction of different peoples and how Stonehenge emerged and stuff like that. To me, it's really interesting to read archaeology or historical fiction after encountering ancient DNA and understanding the real truth, because a lot of times they were not that far off, but you have such crisp precision and a sense of understanding. And that's what we're really all, I mean, Spencer and I, at least, and I think everyone listening here, that's what we're really all about, to actually know the truth as it was instead of simply an imagined truth. 
to actually imagine the truth and have it come to life. That is a really awesome thing about something like the Cheddar Man story, just the reconstruction, even though I have quibbles with it. The aspiration, I totally agree with. Okay. I think we'll end it there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. For more information about Insightome, our podcasts, and our genetic products, check out our website at insito.me. That's I-N-S-I-T-O dot M-E. Thank you.